call to order the meeting of the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District Board of Managers on June 25th, 2019. All managers are present except Manager Rognes and Manager Hajimati, who is will be here in a moment. Um, is there any member of the public who wishes to address the board in a matter that's not on the agenda? Then I would like a motion to approve the agenda. Approve. Manager Miller, is there a second? Second. Manager Maxwell, and those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. We'll move to the consent agenda. <clears throat> Today it has the approval of the minutes of the June 13th board meeting, approval of the general checking account, check register, the surety checking account register, and two other consent items. Resolution 19065, authorization to purchase stormwater monitoring equipment. And resolution 19066, authorization to submit MS4 annual report to the MPCA. Move approval. Thank you, Manager Olson. Is there a second? Second. second. Manager Loftus. Those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? I attended uh, two meetings um, in the last, since our last, almost last meeting, our last regular meeting. Um, one was um, on Maud's behalf, I attended the local government water roundtable, and one of the topics of discussion was watershed-based funding. Uh, the next step for that is to go to the Bowser Committee, so it's moving along. Um, and then, of course, last Thursday, we were all at the board retreat, um, and it was wonderful to have all seven of us there and to have Manager Maxwell um, sworn in, so that was a real treat. Um, the uh, last item is that I want to appoint uh, the new managers to committees, and that is subject to board approval. But I would appoint Manager Hegemati to Operations and Programs Committee, and Manager Maxwell to Planning and Policy Committee. Is there a motion to approve? approval. Thank you, Manager Second. Miller. Manager Olson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, Manager Miller, Policy and Planning Committee report. Uh, we had a uh, in-depth uh, report on the uh, Long Lake uh, sub-watershed activities and uh, uh, very uh, complete and it's a, a, a long-term project that we've got some very committed and uh, partners in the three cities and the, and the uh, lake association i don't think they call it a lake association long lake waters long lake waters because it includes more than just the people in the lake uh, and then we also had an update on 325 Lake Road. Okay, thank you. Are there other meetings or events managers want to report on? Uh, the upcoming meeting uh, event schedule, including the CAC meeting with its revised date, is in the agenda. And Manager Olson, thank you for attending the July 17th <coughs> CAC. Um, we'll move to item 10.1, which is permit 19 170. Uh, Ms. Quinn. Thank you. Um, so this evening, uh, permit 19-170 is before you as the applicant has requested a variance from full compliance with the two feet of free board requirement under the alteration rule. Um, in addition to the variance request, the project does, um, the applicant has also applied for a erosion control permit and a floodplain alteration permit. Um, in general, the project um, is proposing a two lot combination into one lot removing one of the existing single-family home structures and creating addition to the other existing family home structure. Um, so this evening we'll go through uh, the project overview, the rule analysis. I will summarize the applicant's various variance requests that is before the board and then conclude with a staff recommendation. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, 
All right, so the, uh, the two properties are 4798 and 4800 Northern Road in the city of Mound, um, which is also shown. So kind of these two parcels here. So it is just uh, on the south side of Harrison Bay um, off of Shoreline Drive. So kind of zooming in, so in the existing condition, this is the uh, two lots. The western parcel here, this existing sam single family home is proposed to be removed. And then the eastern one is proposed to remain and the addition will be built onto that one. Um, so uh, the proposed condition here, you can see that shown on the survey with the existing house here and then the uh, proposed addition. Uh, as I mentioned, the work triggers the district's erosion control and floodplain alteration rules. There's no proposed work to the shoreline and single family homes are exempt from the district stormwater management requirements. Um, I won't go into detail regarding the erosion control plan, but the applicant has submitted the uh, necessary information to show conformance with the requirements, including a rock construction entrance, uh, silt funds down gradient of site disturbance, and a uh, plan for final stabilization. Uh, so moving on to the floodplain alteration components, uh, the district's floodplain alteration rules triggered for land disturbance below the 100-year floodplain elevation, which for Lake Minnetonka is 931.5. What um, I highlighted in red here, um, that is the 931.5 contour. So as you can see, um, most of the property, so everything on the north side of this red line is within the 100-year floodplain. Um, and so uh, the intent of the floodplain alteration rule is to ensure that there's no loss in floodplain <coughs> storage capacity and requires a one-to-one -one, uh, mitigation for any uh, fill brought on site that the equivalent or greater amount be uh, essentially cut as well. And so the applicant has submitted um, engineered plans that showed the, this kind of dashed line here is the existing structure. So they quantified the impervious that would be removed from here um, as, as well as adding this um, swale on the west side to total um, uh, mitigation of 331 cubic feet. Um, and then it, building the addition, the proposed sidewalk here and the footings for the deck will result in 360, 16 cubic feet of fill. Um, so they've been able to demonstrate and reviewed by the district engineer that the project will actually result in a uh, creation of 15 cubic feet of new floodplain storage on the site. Um, and then, as I had mentioned, they are requesting a variance from the two feet of freeboard requirements. So and I'll discuss that in greater detail, but um, essentially what they're showing here is a, a finished floor elevation at 931.5. The district's rule requires two feet um, which would, uh, to come in conformance with that, would be 933.5. Um, and then all other provisions of the uh, floodplain alteration rule actually aren't applicable to the project. And so besides the variance request, they have shown um, conformance with the rule. So to quickly remind the board um, regarding variance request criteria, the applicant um, must demonstrate that it is a special condition inherent to the property um, and that strict compliance with the rule would cause an undue hardship. The hardship was not created by the landowner. Uh, granting the variance won't be in, uh, serve as a convenience to the applicant, uh, that there were other alternatives considered and that the intent of the rule is still met. And so I'm just gonna go back to the survey as well. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, the applicant seeking a variance um, on the 3F of the floodplain alteration rule for providing 1.6 feet of freeboard from the low opening to the 100 year floodplain, which is a 0.4 foot, 0.4 foot shortfall um, from the required 2 feet of freeboard. Uh, the applicant has requested the variance as the goal of the um, project and the addition is to create a main floor living space for an elevator elderly relative, um, and I, they did explore the feasibility of putting a ramp in, um, which they determined there wasn't quite enough space to get the desired slope that they would like, and they also looked at doing um, a step up from the existing house 
which would um, cause some potential mobility issues in the future um, for the relative. I'd also like to point out that, um, and, and I verified with the city, that the existing structure on the east lot was built in 2006. Um, that was during a time that the city of Mound had regulatory authority. And so when the um, structure was built, it was in conformance with the city's requirements as the city regulates the 100-year floodplain to the 931 elevation, um, where the district regulates to the 931.5. Um, during that time, the applicant was unaware of the um, half-foot discrepancy between the floodplain elevations, nor were they aware that they were going to be uh, purchasing the western parcel in the future at the time. Um, and then they have also shown that the intent of the rule is met as they are uh, creating additional floodplain storage on the site. And uh, staff, the district engineer, um, and legal counsel have uh, looked at the variance application and determined that um, since the applicant is assuming or willing to assume any flooding risk, um, which would be memorialized in a form of a declaration, that there would not be any flooding risk to the adjacent properties, um, nor would there any, uh, be any harm or risk to uh, natural resources within the area, as the variance request would really only affect the uh, structure itself. And so um, with that, staff have found that uh, the applicant has submitted sufficient um, application materials for the board to consider the variance request and recommend that if the board um, grants the variance request that uh, staff recommend approval of the permit as with the conditions outlined in the report, which I have summarized here again. So reimbursement of fees, um, submission of that declaration for memorializing the non-compliant low opening, which would then be recorded with the county. And then staff would also like to ask the board to consider if submission of a draft um, indemnification of the district for flooding damages. Uh, that may arise from the non-compliant low opening be a condition of the approval um, and would leave that up to the board to determine if that's necessary as a condition of the variance. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the variance? Approval. Manager Miller, is there a second? Second. Manager Olson. Are there any questions from Ms. Quinn? Manager Olson. Um, the houses are on slabs there? Yes, correct, Manager Olson. Uh, they'll be just on slab, no, um, no basements, and the really the only proposed grading is to create this additional 27 cubic feet of uh, floodplain storage on the west side. Okay. Is the old structure still there? Both of those structures are, Manager Olson, both of those structures are currently existing. Okay. Um, and the western one would be fully removed. Okay. With its own permits and everything else. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? With the with its own permits for removal and all that <coughs> type of... Yeah, so the, the permit for the erosion control and floodplain alteration portion um, would be for the, the demolition and construction of the addition. Okay. Question. Maybe it's probably for the city attorney or the, city, for the attorney. If, if you do have those other recommendations, does that go with the property then? Does it just tie to the property all the time? So that the, the, the applicant doesn't have to worry about uh, if he sells the property that he'd have to come back before the board or anything like that. It'll just stay with the property. Madam President, Manager Maxwell, there's two recommendations up there. The middle one uh, would require that there be a declaration so that this condition of the non-compliant low floor opening would be recorded on the property, run with title, and so every subsequent purchaser would be on notice that the property owner requested and received this variance. Okay. That, I think, is the most important piece. Yes. The second piece would suggest that the current property owners, if they sell and a subsequent purchaser has flooding damage and seeks to sue the district for that, these current property owners would still, having sold the property, be on the hook to indemnify the district. That's kind of a belt and suspenders approach, and uh, I think it's raised just for the board's consideration. Um, I think the primary role in terms of the district has a number of immunities as the permitting authority. When someone does come forward and ask for this kind of variance, we do want it uh, memorialized so that subsequent purchases are on notice, and that's the fundamental legal protection. Thank you. 
Any other questions? Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Now we'll move to permit 19170. Is there a motion to approve the permit with the three conditions listed? <coughs> so moved. Manager Olson, is there a second? Manager Hedgemati. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Thank you, Ms. Quinn. Are you the owner? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, welcome to welcome to our meeting. <laughs> now we'll go to item 10.2, which is permit report. Uh, permit 18-536. Thank you, President White, Board of Managers. Um, so the, uh, this does say 2018 storm sewer project that the city of Orno is proposing, and uh, that is just as the project is titled per the city plans. It is an application that we received last year, and the project was just uh, put on hold until this year. <coughs> to clarify that, um, the city is proposing to rehabilitate existing degraded storm sewers. Um, in several locations throughout the city um, with the method referred to as cured in place pipe, which I'll just refer to as CIPP for short. It is essentially lining the pipe with a high strength resin um, so that you don't actually have to go in and trench out the pipe or replace the entire pipe itself. Um, so of the various locations, I believe there are about 10 throughout the city. Only three of them require a permit from the district for water body crossings and structures because um, along with the um, CIPP lining, there are some proposed improvements to the inlets and outfalls that will come in contact with the better bank of a identified first order stream. Um, I should also mention that the, the city is not requesting a variance or exception to the water body crossings and structures rule. However, during the public notice period, a member of the public did request the board to consider the permit in writing. And um, I made several attempts to contact that resident. However, I never did receive a response to try to set up a meeting. Um, so very similar to the other presentation, we'll go over a project overview, uh, the analysis of the water body crossings and structures criteria, and then conclude with a staff recommendation. Um, within the permit report, I, I tried to include an appendix to the site plan to kind of help show where we were in the district as there are several locations. Um, however, these are the three spots that do um, trigger the district rule. So uh, figure, oops, figure 6B, um, which is, this is Kelly Avenue. This is the freshwater building in Navarre. Um, and then actually 6D is just kind of northwest of that same location. And then the third location that is off of Farview Lane, uh, north of Maxwell's Bay. And I apologize for some of the little editing things that got mm -hmm. switched up here. Um, and as I mentioned overall, so the, this method of CIPP lining, um, it's, it's very uh, minimal land disturbance associated with it. So overall, the entire project, even within all 10 locations, uh, doesn't have enough land disturbance to trigger the erosion control requirements um, under the rule. However, they are incorporated into the water body crossings and structures rule as well. Uh, there is no proposed change in impervious with the project, so there, uh, it is exempt from the stormwater management requirements. Uh, there are no proposed wetland impacts, and technically the buffer provisions are triggered whenever the water body crossings and structures rule is triggered. However, the wetlands um, that are within the location of the project are either um, on private property or outside of the right of way and therefore the buffer provisions um, aren't applied for the project. And so now I'll just kind of zoom into each of these a little bit more so that you can see what the proposed work is. So for figure 6B, once again, we're off of Kelly Avenue. This is the um, freshwater building in Navarre. So this would be, what's that there? 19 that it comes up to, I think it's 15. Um, so this little orange area here, that is where they are proposing to line the existing pipe. Um, and then on the kind of the north side of that is where they'll be installing a concrete apron at the trash guard 
and some riprap for energy dissipation. There is a kind of network of first order streams that come down through here and actually drain, I believe, through these people's property into the lake. So that is 6B. Um, moving over to the Fairview Lane one, this is the existing pipe here that they're proposing to line. And then once again, doing some manhole improvements, installing a head wall on the side with some grip wrap. And there's a stream that comes down through here to this person's property. And then kind of back over to Kelly Avenue. <clears throat> They're proposing to line the pipe here that is between these two wetlands. The city did submit a zoomed in figure that was uh, included in the permit report, uh, confirming that the proposed work is outside of the wetland boundary um, and won't meet the, won't impact the wetland, which was um, also confirmed in a notice of decision that was issued by the district for no loss. And so this is kind of a high level list of the criteria that must be submitted to show conformance with the district's water body crossings and structures rule. Uh, the city has met all of this criteria and I can go into it in detail if you'd like. But the main thing that staff and the district engineers look at is ensuring that um, hydraulic capacity will be maintained from existing to proposed conditions. <clears throat> so looking at um, that lining the pipe with this resin, which is gonna slightly change the roughness of the pipe, isn't going to cause an increase to the flood stage upstream or downstream. Um, and the city of Orno did submit a hydraulic analysis to demonstrate that, which was also reviewed and confirmed um, by the district engineer. Um, and then we also, the district and the city have a executed pragmatic maintenance agreement that covers the maintenance of these outfalls as well. And that concludes my presentation for that one. The typical conditions, um, the administrative items that are usually listed um, in con recommendation for approval have already been fulfilled. Um, so therefore, staff recommends approval of permit 18.536. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the permit? Approval. Manager Hashimati, is there a second, Manager Miller? Uh, did you have a question, Manager Hashimati? No, no, no. Okay. Yes, we have a motion and a second. Are there any questions for Ms. Quinn? I have a question. You okay. talked about the resident that you try to notify. Did we do that by mail or we do that just in phone call? Oh yes, Manager Maxwell. So um, part of our procedural requirement um, is that we mail a public notice to residents within 600 feet of a proposed project, um, giving them the opportunity to either ask questions, uh, contact staff, review site plans. Um, if they have particular concerns, we try to meet with them informally um, to understand those better. Um, and it does give them the option to submit a written request for the board to um, consider the permit application. It's a 14-day it's a public notice okay. period. And the one resident that you try to, uh, to get a hold of just never recontacted. No, she, the, the resident gave me a phone call, left me a message, um, and then I received the postcard, I, I believe, either later that day or the next day. Um, and so I, I had the phone number on my caller ID, so I, I called back that number several times, left several messages. Okay, I just, I just didn't know the process we did. Yeah, you. absolutely. Any other questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Moving to um, item 11.1, .1, which is resolution 19067, Ms. Christopher. President White, managers, um, tonight I have two um, local water plans for the board's consideration. Uh, the first is for the city of Tonka Bay. And just as a kind of general overview of what I'll cover, um, we'll just first kind of orient everyone um, to the area and then um, review um, kind of what was outlined in the district's plan as kind of the resource concerns and um, management priorities for this area. 
um, and then also what the city has identified in its plan as its priorities um, for this 10-year plan cycle. Um, and then we'll touch on the coordination plan that the city has developed, um, regulatory authority, and whether there's any changes there, and then finally, staff's recommendation. So um, first, this is just the location map. Um, so Tonka Bay covers about one square mile um, within the Lake Minnetonka sub-watershed, um, drains to Lafayette Bay, Gideon Bay, um, upper and lower lake, and is circled there in red. Um, here's a little bit zoomed in um, version just of, of the sub-watershed itself. Um, and in our uh, 2017 plan, um, kind of the issues, main issues identified for this part of the lake are really uh, mainly the altered shoreline um, as well as some localized flooding. Um, you can see the impaired water bodies for Lake Minnetonka are shown in kind of the, the brownish orange. So um, Tonka Bay does not drain to any of the impaired water bodies or have any load reduction requirements. So the main strategies um, in this area um, in the district's plan are um, protection through permitting, um, promoting shoreline best practices, and then implementing opportunity-based stormwater management. Um, so as far as the um, Tonka Bay's implementation plan, some of the things that they identified were um, similarly kind of opportunity-based stormwater treatment, whether that's on city park land or as they do street projects. Um, coordinating with the district on those. Um, they run a sweet, street sweeping program, um, and they also talk about adopting a best management practices guide. Um, and then a couple of other items they talk about are just um, education of, of their residents on things like phosphorus fertilizer use, um, and then finally looking at their uh, practices related to um, road salt application, um, as that's kind of a concern metro-wide. <clears throat> so in their coordination plan, um, some of the things that they identified were an annual meeting uh, with the district to review, you know, CIPs for the year, um, kind of their activities from the previous year, any pending um, land use changes. Um, they also identify, you know, early coordination on any um, redevelopment um, that they anticipate um, in terms of regulation. Um, they've committed to, um, you know, routing requests early to us, um, kind of at the concept phase for any um, planned redevelopment, as well as requiring documentation of district permits. Um, they've also outlined um, um, kind of their interest in coordinating on education and outreach efforts, um, kind of data sharing for, you know, their MS4 report, any new studies, um, and then finally um, noted that they will look to the district for um, helping them identify any grant sources. Um, they are not proposing any changes in term of, terms of regulatory authority, um, and they do not currently implement any um, sole permitting authority for the district's rules, um, and the district also serves as the uh, local government unit for the Wetland Conservation Act. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so staff has verified that the plan meets all the necessary requirements. Um, of the district's plan as well as statute and rules and is recommending approval and I can take any questions. Is there a motion to adopt resolution 19067? <laughs> so moved. Manager so. Olson, second the manager Maxwell. Any questions for Ms. Christopher? Manager Olson? Did they identify what grant money they were seeking or they just said help us out? Anything and everything. I think both um, kind of internal district funding or external sources. So specifically, as they look at any um, you know stormwater management opportunities. Okay. Is is this plan like a comprehensive plan every ten years or five years or when do they have to submit these? Sure. Yeah. Manager Maxwell managers. Um, so this uh, the local water plan is actually a chapter of the comprehensive plan. So it's on a ten year cycle. Ten year cycle. Yep. I don't remember seeing the BMP um, practices laid out in that kind of format before. Have we had that. Do you think any of our plans? It was interesting. Um, I'm not sure I understand. Oh, they had, um, didn't they have a, a form where they had boxes and it was filled in for the best oh, practice sure. for the BMPs? Sure, uh, manager, white managers. Um, that is, yeah, part of their um, kind of their MS4 or their, their stormwater okay. pollution prevention plan. Um, is It is a pretty common format that I think some of the consultants okay. use. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. 
so yeah, and a lot of them use the same consultants. So <laughs> you do see similar format in, in several of them. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions for Ms. Christopher? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And now, yep. St. Louis Park. Yes. Um, so the other one um, for your consideration tonight is for the city of St. Louis Park. Um, run through the similar outline. Um, so of course, the city of St. Louis Park is located in the Minnehaha Creek subwatershed. Um, it covers about 10 square miles um, within the district and then extends a little bit into Bassett um, Creek Watershed Management Commission to the north. Um, major receiving water body is Minnehaha Creek. Um, and then they also have um, several smaller lakes um, within the city, including Cobblecrest, Hannon, Twin, and then Meadowbrook, which is in line with the creek. Um, so in terms of the district's plan, um, there are a number of, of issues, including a number of impairments um, in this subwatershed. Uh, the creek itself is impaired for chloride, bacteria, dissolved oxygen, um, fish and macroinvertebrates. Um, and then of course it drains to like Hiawatha, which is impaired for nutrients. Um, and then also both Cobblecrest and Twin are on the impaired waters list as well for nutrients. Um, in addition, um, there's um, issues with hydrology in terms of um, you know, things being drained and straightened and, and this, this system being very flashy, um, localized flooding issues, um, and then also um, degraded and, and disconnected habitat and, and habitat corridors. Um, so obviously this is a focal area for the district in its plan, um, and there's been a lot of work to date um, in partnership with St. Louis Park um, through the Greenway. Um, and some of the main strategies overall for the subwatershed are stormwater management um, and then creek, wetland, and corridor restoration. Um, so the city's plan um, and their uh, implementation plan primarily focus on, um, they have a pretty substantial um, capital improvement plan that includes a number of water quality improvement projects um, aimed at addressing the, the impairments um, for Minnehaha Creek and Lake Hiawatha. Uh, these include um, several um, opportunities to treat, to provide regional stormwater treatment on city parkland um, that they've flagged throughout their CIP and, and um, say they've committed to um, coordinating with the district on those. Um, there's also some pond retrofits that they've identified to um, provide additional treatment. And then um, kind of the remainder of their implementation plan is mainly um, focused around administering their, their state um, stormwater pollution prevention plan, so things like street sweeping, BMP maintenance, education, um, and the like. Um, so for their coordination plan, um, uh, similar to, to others, they've um, identified an annual meeting um, to review um, progress toward implementing their plan, um, upcoming development, um, capital improvement plans, um, as well as just areas for improved coordination on um, whether that's permitting or, or the project side of things. Mm -hmm. um, they did outline um, and we provided kind of a summary of our areas of interest for coordination um, that they've incorporated into their plan um, in terms of ongoing work in the Greenway or other areas so that there's clear contact points um, and, and um, expectations around those. And then, as I mentioned, they've identified a number of projects in their CIP um, that they will coordinate with us on an annual basis. Um, a few other things they've identified are uh, just the ongoing operation and maintenance of shared investments, such as the, the trails and things in the Greenway, um, as well as education programming around those. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then permitting coordination um, in terms of routing things to us and requiring um, documentation of district permits. Uh, so the city of St. Louis Park does, um, has since uh, 2016 had um, sole permitting authority for erosion control um, and they are proposing to retain that um, and the, but all other areas um, of district regulation are still implemented by the district um, and then the city acts as the Wetland Conservation Act LGU. Um, so there is one small outstanding item, which is an inventory of city-owned property, which most um, have just provided a map. Um, 
and there seems to have just been some confusion, um, I think, between the city and its consultants on whether this one was met, and so just sort of a small thing um, that still needs to be added, which they're in the process of, of working on, but they've asked that we kind of move it through and just put that as a condition, um, just to not slow the process. So aside from that, it meets all requirements, and staff is recommending approval um, just with the condition that that inventory be added. And I'll take any questions. Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt <coughs> resolution 19068? Move approval. Manager Miller, is there a second? Second. Manager Loftus, any questions for Ms. Christopher? It was like reading War and Peace. <laughs> 641. So you. Did you really read them? They <laughs> yeah. had everything we've ever done with them in there. So yes. <laughs> sure, by sure weight. <laughs> it would it's a lot it. to get through. Yeah. <laughs> Figure 213 is uh, monitoring uh, water quality and quantity monitoring. There are five sites on the creek, four in St. Louis Park and one in Hopkins. Are those all our monitoring equipment, the, the Washington District's equipment? Mm. Brian's not still here, is he? Um, that seems like a more than what we have in terms of there are there you know how there's that quarter of hopkins so there are four in st louis park between meadowbrook and um west, west 169 yeah and then there's one yeah, that's that in that corner of hopkins yeah that sounds right okay we, we have at least two sites yeah so that not 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 all the uh white managed not all those are um stormwater sampling sites some of those are stormwater some of them are um, but we would have that that mixture of stream sites versus water continuous sort of uh, stormwater. Pump. Did you say anchor? Yeah. So the district maintains a level of anchor sites, so sites that we uh, monitor on a regular uh, basis for turn. just stream flow. And uh, and I know we have sites at Excelsior <laughs> and West 36, which would be anchor. And then we have continuous sampling at Lake Street, Powell Road. Um, I believe there's one other, which would be probably Metal Rock Lake. So yes. That would make it look fine. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to add a comment for the, the new members, just as an aside, aside from this permit question, or this agreement, rather. Um, there's an agreement in place with Lifetime Fitness in St. Louis Park um, that might possibly provide funding for some projects, some water quality projects in St. Louis Park. That's outside the, the bounds of the, our agreement with the city, but I just mentioned it as a extra information yeah and um, president white managers that is one of the areas that we called out in the coordination plan okay um, i didn't see it thank you um is anything else from ms christopher those in favor please say aye all right aye. Aye. any opposed thank you thank you i'm going to share a quick personal note as long as i've got y'all i already told a couple of managers but i'm expecting a baby and I'm due January 4th. So New little water store. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. And I, as, a re as a result, I've been noticing I'm short of breath anytime I try presenting. So. Well, congratulations. Congratulations. We wish great. you the very best. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll watch things develop. <laughs> Glad you said that, not me. <laughs> Ms. Brown, Resolution 19069. Thank you, President Wayne Managers. <clears throat> um, so I'm seeking authorization this evening to uh, release a request for proposals for design services for Wasserman Lake Park. Um, as the board is aware, the Wasserman Lake Park is an opportunity um, to sort of create the first flagship project in Victoria that highlights our integrated approach um, to land use and water investment. Um, the site that we've referred to as the Wasserman West site um, is about a 33-acre site um, and includes 22 acres of wetland, um, a six-acre pond within that wetland, about 1,500 feet of undisturbed shoreline, um, as well as a ravine and creek along the southern edge of the property. Um, the site first sort of piqued the district's interest um, when we identified 
that the pond on site was a um, major source of phosphorus to Lake Wasserman, um, which is an impaired water body. And through the process of kind of evaluating uh, a project opportunity there, we worked with the city um, and identified this opportunity to go kind of above and beyond um, treating the pond uh, to really integrate that investment and preserve and restore the shoreland site, um, as well as create a public amenity consistent with the city's park and recreation plans. Um, some of the major milestones in this project to date, um, we first approved and executed the purchase agreement for the site with the then seller um, in February of 2017. Um, and closing on the site was contingent at that time on us developing a cooperative agreement with the city of Victoria. Um, so in May of that year, we um, approved the what's now the first cooperative agreement, um, which essentially spelled out um, a plan for jointly developing a park concept um, and implementation plan, um, as well as spelling out um, how the district would transfer the title of the land to the city um, once the park concept was developed. Um, we then uh, approved a, um, and executed a design scope to develop this concept plan, uh, which was completed in June of 2018. Um, and then just about a month ago, at the end of May of 2019, um, the board and council both approved our second phase cooperative agreement. Um, I'm going to just run through some of the highlights of that cooperative agreement. Um, it spelled out um, in terms of design uh, how the city and district would work together to develop the final design um, and that we would share the costs of that park design um, except for as it relates to a park shelter which would, would be a sole city expense. Um, it also spoke to how we would share the construction costs um, and costs of construction oversight. Uh, consistent with the first cooperative agreement, the city is responsible for all of the sort of park amenity investments um, where the district is paying for the um, site improvements that relate to natural resources. So um, alum treatment of the pond, uh, restoration of that creek channel, um, as well as some of the vegetative enhancements in the wetland and woodland. Um, and then construction oversight, the district is going to lead uh, the construction oversight from a staff perspective, and then any contract for construction oversight will be a shared expense between uh, the district and the city. Um, for project financing, the agreement sort of presumes that uh, the park will be financed through the use of uh, the district's agreement with Carver County, our master finance agreement. Um, but it does give the city the opportunity to make kind of a final determination um, either in advance of or at the time of approval of the 90% design plan. So as we approach the final design and transition to construction, um, and then finally, is in terms of project approvals, it spells out where both city and council um, will need to, or excuse me, uh, council and board will need to um, approve a component of the project to advance it forward. Um, and after the approval of the design scope and contract, those milestones are 90% design um, and then the uh, construction contract award. Um, and when those milestones are met, we will close on the property with the city and advance towards construction. Um, so that gets us to the action tonight, um, authorization to release that request for proposals. Um, so in evaluating our options for advancing this project through final design, um, it's staff's recommendation that we uh, issue a competitive um, request for proposals. Um, we've developed a scope of work document and the um, RFP document included in your packet. And I'm just going to run through kind of the principal components of, of that document. Um, the services requested, um, a majority of the uh, project scope sort of falls within, within the wheelhouse of a landscape architect, um, as well as uh, some engineering and architectural design services. So I expect that a lot of our responses, the lead consultant will be in the landscape architecture field, um, but we are going to distribute the RFP widely to our full list of consultants, um, which includes 
landscape architects, planners, as well as um, engineers. The uh, scope of work is organized into four major task areas. Um, the first being community and stakeholder engagement. Uh, so the consultant will work closely with our communications and education staff to develop and execute an engagement process. Um, because we've done a lot of outreach to date and we've developed a lot of public support both in the neighborhood um, and the city more broadly, um, we don't expect that we need to run um, a, a very robust engagement process like we might um, if the project was controversial, if we were just starting out. Um, the purpose of this engagement process is really to um, keep the public informed and then help refine the park concept as we get into a, a higher level of detail. Um, and then for the engagement component, it also spells out where um, the consultant will be coming to board and council. Um, and they'll attend our uh, meeting at 60% design, which will be principally looking for feedback from, from each body. Um, and then again, at 90% design, um, they'll be, will require approval of the 90% design plans. And the target date for that 90% design approval is um, December of 2019. Uh, for the project design, I think a, a majority of the work is going to fall into that design bucket and I'll sort of detail some of the components of that design on the next slide. Um, but essentially it includes the major milestones, so getting to that 60-90% design level, um, as well as spells out where there's going to be a requirement for um, a little more detail, a little more thought in kind of developing the, the program on site, if you will. Um, the bid, bid document development and bidding will have the consultant involved um, in preparing those final plans, the bid package, and then helping us make a determination for award. Um, and then finally, they'll give us a proposal for the construction oversight piece. Um, the budget for tasks one through three is spelled out in the request for proposals is 250000 which again is shared across those two agencies. And then the... Um, Funding for the construction oversight component will uh, come in as we go through the construction budgeting process. Um, so just to hit briefly on some of the components of the design that we're asking the consultant to work on. Um, first, the, the idea as we advance this design um, further is that it will conform substantially to the concept plan as drafted. Um, so it's really about kind of building out the full plan document set that we need for construction, as well as, again, putting some detail behind these, these specific areas. Um, so for trails and boardwalk, um, the trail will be largely bituminous with boardwalk um, in the wetland, and the boardwalk will follow kind of the standard uh, district boardwalk design. Um, the park shelter currently is proposed to be kind of an open pavilion um, with the restrooms either attached or adjacent. Um, the lake and shoreline access is kind of a big component. Um, we have identified kind of ideal locations for where people can kind of get out and, and touch the water, um, but need to put some more work behind um, how they're kind of engaging in that area. We've talked about um, a fishing pier, we've talked about whether we would want to have kayak access, um, whether there should be kind of a children-oriented shoreline area, so that will be further developed through design. Um, the nature play area is a priority of the cities, um, and we've identified a, a great location for it, but again, need to put some more thought behind. When we say nature play, are we talking about some logs and sticks, or are we talking about sort of a structure, you know, putting more definition around what that looks like? Um, for the stream channel restoration, um, unlike a lot of our projects, this isn't a, a major component of the overall design. The stream channel on site is um, an intermittent stream that drains a large wetland south of the property that has some erosion issues. Um, so we'll be looking to kind of stabilize that area. Um, and there will also be some trail and, and a bridge that um, goes over that. So there'll be some connection to that, that stream area. Um, the vegetation plan will have the consultant work closely with um, our um, internal experts um, to kind of develop the overall uh, plan for vegetation that really seeks to 
um, primarily use native vegetation on site. Um, and then finally, the interpretive plan. And so when I say uh, interpretive plan, I really mean kind of the signage or other educational features on site. Um, and we'll have the consultant work really closely with our uh, communication education staff to develop that overall interpretive plan. Um, so in terms of timeline, the RFP, uh, we're looking to release it this week. Um, and then as it's open, we'll hold a um, informational meeting at City Hall, um, sort of in the middle of that open window. Um, and then we'd be looking to receive the proposals July 22nd. Um, we'll then hold interviews the following week. Um, and we'll be bringing back a recommendation um, to the board for contract award in late August. Um, as we're evaluating and looking at these proposals, the criteria kind of fall into three major categories. Um, methodology includes their project understanding, um, their uh, understanding of the goals and requirements in the project, um, and then also the, their proposed schedule, making sure that they can meet our, our scheduling needs. Um, for experience, of course, we'll be looking at the expertise of the team and their ability to carry the project forward. Um, and then finally, we'll be looking at how cost effectively they're proposing to, to get the work done. Um, so with that, I am seeking authorization to release this request for proposals. And again, with that authorization, um, we'll be returning with a recommendation in August. Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt resolution 19069? Move approval. Manager Olson, is there a second? Second. Manager Miller, questions? Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, several. Uh, it, uh, who's responsible for the uh, servicing the debt obligation? Manager Miller, the city would be responsible okay. for servicing. And what's uh, the breakdown between the uh, easements, ownership, and maintenance agreements on the various elements? Uh, Manager Miller, so when we transfer title, we'll be retaining um, easement over all the wetlands, um, the wooded areas in that stream corridor. Um, and the majority of the site maintenance will, will fall on the city. Um, and we haven't negotiated the specifics of the maintenance agreement yet, um, but I think we would probably look to retain some amount of maintenance on the, the vegetation components and the natural resource components. Great. Thank you. Other questions? There's um, a mention on the 60% design discussion that we're working on our strategic uh, communications plan and there's hopefully going to be um, some cross um, action there. Yes, President White. So the, the interpretive plan, I think we'll look to start that work kind of on the tail end of the findings of the strategic communications plan. So that's um, in October. And then we will be able to develop our, our signage and educational features around um, some of the key messaging that we've identified through Okay, Miller. What do we? Uh, what's the total cost of the project here? Is completed? Uh, Manager Miller, the uh, city's component of the project is about 2.1 million, um, and ours is estimated at about uh, 400 thousand, and that includes the alum treatment, which we have grant funding for. Thank you. Any other questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Could you um, get the meet the open house dates to me? I'd be interested in that. Thank you. A discussion item 12.1, Minnehaha uh, Parkway Regional Trail Master Plan update, Ms. Shuffler. Yes. It may not record. Need batteries? Three of them. 
It's a batteries not included situation. <laughs> Chair White Managers, tonight I'm here before you to provide an update on the Minnehaha Park Ray Regional Trail Master Plan. And that's an initiative that's being led by the Minneapolis Park and Rec Board, but the district is um, very much participating in um, the, the concepts that are coming out of that. And what I want to do is, for Manager Maxwell and his body's um, benefits, provide a, a pretty good background on why we're in Minneapolis and why we're focusing on the Minneapolis the watershed, and then walk through the master plan process to date, um, all the community engagement that goes into that, and where the current vision has landed for that master plan, and then we'll end with looking at the actual concept concepts that have come out of um, some, a few iterations based on community feedback, and then we'll end with next steps and a few questions that I have for the board managers. And just for reference as well, um, the planning and policy pol planning and policy committee have discussed this um, and have been given updates on it. Um, we did last December and then most recently in February after the initial concepts were released in January. <coughs> so why Minneapolis Creek? We just heard Ms. Chris Ms. Christopher discuss why it's, it's important to focus and um, look at St. Louis Park's uh, management plan there. And it's really because Minyak Creek is it's a regional resource. You know, it's, it's our namesake. It travels down five communities. And it's really a lot of its impact are due to the rapid urbanization that happened um, pre our existence and these sort of stormwater regulation. And those disruptions and disturbances have resulted in not only the Minyak Creek being impaired, but downstream like Hiawatha and Nokomis. And a lot of that is a result of just the flashiness. Um, what rain falls on the landscape and quickly washes into Minia Creek via stormwater. And you see this large flush of water come through and then subside. So we, we know that is a big resource need. And then the other reason why we're in, in Minia Creek subwatershed is just the opportunity. We've known that we've spent the last decade in the Minia Creek Greenway establishing those relationships. Um, we've moved that partnership model downstream in Tweedina and are just wrapping up our Arden Park restoration. So naturally, we're now continuing our trajectory, moving further downstream and doing um, work with the park board in the city of Minneapolis. So the timeline for how we've gotten to this current juncture point and why Minneapolis now was really, really catalyzed by the 2014 flooding. Um, we had the flood of, that was the flood of record since our existence as a watershed district and resulted in some um, really high flows on Minneapolis Creek, which resulted in some pretty sustained flood damage, especially in Minneapolis because of that flashiness. So we spent the fall of 2014 assessing Minneapolis Creek, assessing where all the flood damage was, and then negotiating and coordinating with FEMA to see if we could leverage some federal, federal monies to do some of the repair work. As we were going through that process, we stopped and paused and said, you know, we, we don't want to come in and just do some stream rank repairs if there's big opportunities, if there's a stormwater outfall nearby or a trail that was damaged as well. You know, what? how can we coordinate with the city and park board to really figure out how we could do, possibly do something bigger here in our spirit of partnership and collaboration? And that really spurred the conversation around how could we jointly plan the whole corridor of Minneapolis and then led to the conversations an adoption of a memorandum of understanding that was adopted by all agencies, all three agencies in 2017. <clears throat> and out of that MOU, we also um, worked with our board to um, discuss how we would approach that work. And all three agencies jointly issued a request for qualifications to not only design the FEMA repairs, but to then also do the master plan work as well. So that happened. It was in kind of already in flux um, as we were designing the FEMA repairs and just starting to articulate what the master plan process might look like. And then at the same kind of time as that was happening, um, this, the city of Minneapolis kicked off a, a flood study kind of in the same vicinity, just southwest of Lake Harriet, which then both agencies were at the table at. And then um, in April of this last year, we held some joint oak with houses 
to, to discuss all the kind of moving pieces that are happening in Minneapolis um, so, so members of the public could understand um, how we're coordinating together, how you know things might interject, intersect in their community, whether it's a flood study or the creek repairs or the master plan process. And then really in earnest, the project that's before you tonight kicked off last July um, when they held their first community advisory committee meeting. So this is just an example of a poster that was at that April 2018 open house that all three agencies um, held for the various projects. And it just trying to articulate to the public what the MOU was, what it was trying to accomplish um, by all having all three agencies coordinate together. And then at the bottom, just touched on the four projects that was before them that evening. And next, I'm going to throw up a map that we've used quite a bit just to explain all the different things are happening in the city of Minneapolis. So in the big orange uh, square to the left, the par park board is simultaneously master planning. Can I ask a question? Okay. Uh, the, uh, in the southwest area, the uh, flood study area, what percent of that area was a wetland originally? Manager Miller, that's a good question. I don't know off the top of my head, but I can certainly... I mean, just a rough guess. I don't just <laughs> just throw out a number. I know around, and I can pull up at the end. I know around like the Comus and the Kaiwatha, there were certainly more wetlands. I can't recall if there was a lot around Harriet. More around Calhoun than Harriet. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> um. So the 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 larger orange rectangle to the left is, as I was saying, um, the park board's also simultaneously master planning all the neighborhood parks in that area, which um, one of those, as you'll, as we know, intersects with the Minneapolis Creek master plan at Lynnhurst. So um, that was useful because that was also intersected with the south, city southwest here at Flood Study, which Manager Miller just noted, and trying to do some underground storage in some of those neighborhood parks. And then we had our FEMA repairs going on, um, the park board's master planning the whole corridor. Um, the park board's also master planning the Hiawatha Golf Course. And then the area to the south by Lake Nokomis, as the board's aware, is um, all three agencies have been also coordinating on the Nokomis groundwater stuff. So a lot of stuff happening in Minneapolis. Some things intersect, some things don't, but it's just kind of a grounding for folks as, as they become engaged at various initiatives from each agency to understand intersection um, where that is applicable. So, <clears throat> again, why Minneapolis Creek? As I said, it's, it's our namesake. It was the reason why we established severe flooding along the creek in the mid-60s. Um, it's impaired and um, also leads to some impairments of some of the chain of lakes. And currently, we have you know some willing partners at the table to co-plan and really envision what the whole Minot Creek corridor could look like. And what I try to do here and um, what's been kind of a, a learning curve for the community as we've been master planning is understanding the current issues along from Minot Creek from an ecological standpoint and from our watershed district's perspective. So breaking out all of our goals as a watershed water quality issues, um, you're having a lot of excess nutrients because you have storm water just running straight off streets into pipes into the creek, water quantity because you have over 100 stormwater outfalls in the city alone pouring water into the creek. And then those result in the, the e ecological integrity issues. Um, when you have large flashy streams that have been ditched and straightened, there's no habitat or refuge for fish in, the, in folks to um, protect themselves and, and reproduce. Manager Miller. Of, uh, with those hundred outfalls in Minneapolis, what percent of the water uh, going into Lake Tacomas is generated in the city of Minneapolis? <sighs> Manager Miller, I can break that, I can, I can get that information for you. I know, you know, quite a bit comes from um, the city of Richfield and from the Mac, and then there's a large drainage area to the east of the lake that contributes to 
the lake itself, but I don't have the exact breakdown off the top of my head. It would be good to know because uh, there is this false idea that all the water in the creek comes from Lake Minnetonka. Uh, and it would be good to know what percent is generated in, uh, in Minneapolis. And uh, the second question, uh, you know, I know this is a park board driven plan and I, I think they're incredibly good partners. Uh, but the other part of the, of the, uh, the source of uh, runoff into the creek uh, could, could be avoided if, uh, you know, I'm not an engineer or anything, I'll be, you know, everybody knows that. I think. But you play one on television. Though. The question uh, would be, what, uh, if, if those uh, ponds that were developed about 15, 10, 15 years ago in the city where they tore down blocks of houses, uh, if they were designed to catch and hold more water, these recent rains, there's been no water in those, uh, those ponds on Bloomington and other places. And I'm wondering if the design was too specific uh, for uh, the first or last, I don't know, uh, inch, I don't know which, which it was designed for, but they sure as heck could be holding a lot more water than they, than they do in these recent floods. And I, I think some redesign of those things would help uh, uh, with the capacity of the creek. Yeah, Manager Miller, that's something that we've been discussing with Mr. Meehan since the last board meeting when you brought that up, so I'll let him. Yeah, Manager Miller, managers, um, looking at those ponds, they were originally built to handle the storm sewer system internal network versus handling the creek. So as we've kind of progressed in conversations of how we manage water within the creek, that's something that we'd have to uh, start to look at how we could integrate that with those ponds. Um, they were meant to flood really quickly, run off, hold, hold more of the storm surges versus maybe some of these longer term uh, pools that we had to provide the storage. Um, we'd also look at some of the elevation differences of those ponds versus where we are at the creek. Don't have to be able to get that water. You know, I, I don't want to go in and jump into the city's storms. Uh, Sewer uh, engineering department, but uh, but do we have any authority authorities that we could call on to have them redesign those or uh, because you know they're in the recent heavy rains they haven't they haven't I'm sure they did what they were designed to do but I don't I think there's a lot more capability there than it's being um, and they cost millions, tens of millions of dollars to uh, build. And it seems to me we should be looking at that to help uh, uh, get more, get more use. reduce the amount of... Uh, yeah. Mr. Mr. Mann. Manager Miller, Manager White. Um, the city is going through a prioritization of their flood issues that they have within the city right now and how to best utilize the infrastructure that they do have. So the storm sewer systems that they do have and the assets to handle not only what's happening now, but also help them move into the future. So I know they're trying to look at how they can maximize what they do currently have in the flood flow areas. So I would expect through working with the watershed district and their current infrastructure, how to manage those investments. They're evaluating how to best um, best utilize those assets so that it can get more maximized use out of the place. How many of those, how many do they have? Uh, as far as, uh, I don't know. Enough. They got a couple on Chicago, one on Bloomington. It, within the watershed district, I believe it's four or five, if okay. I recall right. Mr. Whisker. Um, if the board wants, you know, outside of the context of tonight's presentation, we can certainly come back and provide a discussion or information item, just a quick scan of here's the facilities within the district that sort of fall under that mm -hmm. umbrella, when they were built, why they were built, the authorities or agreements that are in place, and just a little bit more context on how we think they function and how they fit into the city's evaluation that's underway, and we, we can do that if you like. Because part of the problem may be solved right in the city rather than that. Lake Minnetonka. I, I think that that would be a great um, 
discussion item for us. Um, bring that back. We'll take a look at it. Yeah, managers, I know the city, I think they're just spending the end of this year having all of their flood study wrapped up. So um, we can certainly check in and see if, if that's available now or if that's <sighs> something in the next couple of months that they'll have kind of more refined and, and ready to share. Thank you. Yeah. So the main thing with Minneapolis Creek, especially in the city of Minneapolis, is we know that a lot of the, the former creek channel has been altered, it's been ditched, it's been straightened. We've had wetland loss, and we have a lot of stormwater going to the creek itself. So I just wanted to throw up some drawings that were just helpful to provide that historical context. So these are um, 1912 uh, park board drawings for the improvement to the Minneapolis Parkway. So, um, on your far left is 12th Avenue, and then your east, the far eastern road is Cedar. So what you're seeing here is <clears throat> a darker line is where they're proposing to move Minneapolis Creek to, so you see it kind of gets more straight, whereas this lighter line, you can see all those squiggly, that's with the current creek channel there. I know by Cedar it had a lot more curves in it as well, so um, what's been fun to see is the one on the left circle, we've actually are proposing to put those curves back in. We actually had the park space to do that. So where that allowed um, with this master plan, we did try to, to mimic that some of those historical alignments. And then the other main um, degradation to the creek is just the urbanization of impacts. So if you look at Minneapolis Creek as a total across all five communities, there's over 261 outfall, outfalls, um, 109, 109 of those, or 41%, are in Minneapolis alone. So, and this, what this map does is provides a, um, a drainage area for each of those 109 areas, just to show what water is being, or what land mass is being drawn and drained to directly into Minneapolis Creek. And this is a, a map that's been provided all along as part of the master planning process to the community to help them understand where their water goes. <clears throat> so with that historical knowledge in hand, um, the Watershed District also is um, prides itself on having a foundation of sound science and knowing what we need to, um, how to use that science to focus our work. And we certainly have used that approach in the St. Louis Park Hopkins area where we've had the most polluted stretch of Minneapolis Creek and we've made significant progress towards um, achieving some of those pollutant loading and now the data is telling us to transition downstream into Minneapolis. So this is just a foundation of a lot of that data. So going back to our 2003 HHPLS study, we also had a stream assessment from that time, we updated that in 2012 to see did things improve, did things degrade, and then um, out of that stream assessment, we, we actually did a specific remander study for the city of Minneapolis. And then after that, in 2014, we had our flood assessment, and then um, we were able to leverage um, some Bowser Grant funds to do an outfall study, and then um, recently just implemented our creek femur repair projects and used that information to help um, inform which projects should have been repaired now versus as implemented as part of the master plan process. So I'm just going to briefly touch on one of the more significant studies that was listed on there, and that was our 2018 stormwater outfall study. So what, what Wank did as part of this Clean Water Fund grant was um, looked at 13 priority outfalls along the Creek Corridor in Minneapolis and um, identified the, these 13 as kind of being the worst of the worst. So <coughs> the bigger offenders providing the most pollutant loading um, to the creek. And um, if all of, we've, we push hard to get all 13 of these included in the master plan process. And if all 13 of these were to be implemented, um, the estimated total pounds of, that would be removed is 400 pounds. And that would be the city of Minneapolis's total um, TMDL reduction to Lake Hiawatha, so that would check the box for them if all 13 of these are implemented. Mr. Wesker. Just a quick question. Does yeah. that include the 400 pounds is all upstream? No, that's including the deer pen. Okay. Yeah. So that won't be counted towards Lake Hiawatha, but pretty good chunk. 
Um, and then it also would create 82, 82 acre feet. So um, we've been recently kind of trying to compare um, what one inch of storage creates on Lake Minnetonka, which is around 1,100 acre feet. Um, so you can see how just by installing some a dozen or so BMPs, you can kind of also create a pretty significant uh, storage along the, the corridor. And what the study then did was take down and break every of these, all 13 BMPs into proposed footprint. And then we took that information in hand and went to the, went to the park board when they started to kick off their master plan process to say, okay, we know where the worst offenders are. We know where the creek banners should go. Kind of let's, let's use the, the master plan vehicle to actually get these suggested improvements in the ground. So really our, our main approach to the master plan was trying to restore the natural tr stream function, expand the green space, connect the previous floodplains to the creek again, and then treat regional stormwater where we can. And then doing that in a way that's trying to Im improve and enhance the local community's use and goals of that space as well. So now I'm going to transition into the, the master plan itself. So just for context, Minneapolis Creek, then here's the Minneapolis Creek sub watershed, and then the area that this master plan covers is um, in the bottom right. And <clears throat> the, the Minneapolis Parkway Regional Trail Master Plan, it's a, it's a unique park because it's it's a regional park but it's a linear park um, but there's quite a, when you break down the numbers it includes 253 acres of land and over 5.3 miles of parkway and um, <clears throat> what also was unique was that since all of the park um, was in our watershed district the park board actually asked us to appoint a member to their citizens advisory committee so one of our current CC members sits on the, the advisory committee as well and has been actively participating in, um, from the watershed district perspective, offering that, that comment and input. So where are we at in the CC process? Um, when I spoke with the, the PPC in February, we were at, um, in between five and six there, we were, we, they had reviewed the concepts, they were trying to figure out what are the big kind of questions coming out of those initial concepts. Now we're in between six and seven, so just um, two weeks ago on June 13th, the, the CAC met for their sixth time and reviewed the preferred concepts that were released at the end of May. And now we're meeting again this Thursday to um, kind of review some more of those bigger questions, see if we've honed them down enough, um, and if we're kind of reaching the point of consensus to actually provide preferred recommendations to kind of do the next jumping off point. This is a, a broader um, look at all of the moving pieces we're trying to portray to the public was there's not just this master plan process, there's a master plan process, there's the approvals process, then there's how, how, all, how are all three agencies going to coordinate together, develop a joint CIP, those sorts of things. So trying to convey this isn't happening tomorrow because that's been kind of the sentiment and concern, but it's a, it's a one, one kind of data point in a longer process to envision what the next 30 years will look like. So here's Mr. Mr. Heyman. Um, this is just a picture again to remind the board of all the data that went into the concepts and um, this is just a good picture capturing real real time or, or real input into the our two-day charrette process when, that helped us create the initial concepts. So because it is a linear park, uh, what the park board has done is broken into different segments and which has helped uh, focus and um, create some, some different nuances is between the different site characteristics, whether it's topography, existing recreational facilities, trail connections, or creek access. And at the last CC meeting, we also, or the park board also unveiled um, what they've heard as being priorities and the vision for the creek corridor. So um, obviously there's some good things from our perspective in here, the top one, trying to improve wildlife flood resilience and water quality, trying to just generally enhance the corridor's function, um, trying to um, balance the needs of the creek, but also the needs of people wanting to use it. And the last one there is just trying to 
promote how the agency are going to continue to collaborate um, around this water management um, need. So what I'm going to walk through first is these more corridor-wide um, concepts. So the first one, obviously, is interest to the board here, is looking at the creek restoration and also the proposed BMPs. So um, as I noted, there's over 100 outfalls along the creek. In this concept, we're proposing to do 22 BMPs. And I do want to note that these are just 22 that identified um, where we've kind of focused in on areas. Obviously, there's 80 other outfalls that um, need to be looked at. So what we propose between the city, park board, and the watershed is in their master plan itself, we're not going to identify every outfall and what should be done, but rather provide guiding principles around how we're going to coordinate around future uh, outfalls that aren't identified in the plan and just an order of operations for how to assess um, and look at if there's a real opportunity to do something similar to what's being proposed in the master plan. And then here is the creek access. So uh, they're proposing nine new access points. Um, and that's because overwhelmingly from the community, they've heard they want more opportunity to get down to the water. Not necessarily exactly, it doesn't have to be a, a creek launch, but just provide more uh, um, access to get down and do that. And they're also proposing um, something new here, intentionally creating tubing loops. So not you don't need a kayak or a canoe, but just have an, a tube where you can kind of get in and out and walk and do a loop as much as you want. And then this is um, <laughs> trying to capture all the different activity areas. So currently, the, this, the creek corridor here is pretty pass, passive activity. Um, it's, there's a lot of recreational trails, and they do intersect with the occasional tennis court and um, sledding hill in the winter. And they're trying to still maintain a lot of that passive recreation and trying to do input a little bit more um, what, they, what they still consider passive activities such as picnicking spots, wildlife observations, and again, um, some of these more gradual creek access points. The, the vehicle circulation is probably the biggest sticking point with the community right now. Um, at the CSC two weeks ago, there was over 100 community members that came out, and this was the main concern. So what they're doing here is um, they're trying to contemplate what the role of the parkway should be. Um, when the parkway went in, um, you know, it was kind of used as a, a thoroughfare for folks, and now the park board is saying, well, west of, west of Portland, you have 50th. That can be your kind of thoroughfare. You don't need kind of a redundant parkway along both sides of the creek. East of, east of Portland, they're saying it still has validity and being of a commuter and thoroughfare for folks. So there was certainly opposition and um, support for this. It was kind of almost 50-50, depending on who, you know, who spoke up. Um, so we'll see where they kind of land um, this Thursday with recommend, recommendations here. But generally, what they're trying to propose um, west of the parkway is using that space for just more access to the creek whether it be a, it become a trail or a parking space for that rather than having redundant parkways. So what I'm doing through next is just the, the four concepts that they've honed in on. If you recall, back in February, there was over a dozen concepts. What they've done is where people didn't have a lot of questions, comments, or concerns, they've left those be, and then they've chosen to focus on four areas that... Um, just had some bigger questions that need to be resolved. And here I just wanted to show an example of the progression. So the top left was the initial kind of charrette drawings. The bottom left was what was presented in February as a concept. And then the, the one on the bottom right is where we currently are at, just kind of trying to show the iteration from, um, well, I guess it'd be last November until um, May. So segment one, we'll first look at the Penn Newton Morgan area. So here, what really, and I can I can toggle between um, the January concept and this one. The main thing that changed was the shape and um, kind of footprint. 
front of this canopy. There's a lot of really nice oak trees in that area. Um, so just trying to figure out how we can thoughtfully still accomplish some stormwater management there, but not interfere with um, the existing landscape features there. So here's, you can kind of see a little bit bigger in um, January versus today. And then well, the next focus area is at Lynnhurst Park. So this is the one um, that intersects with that Southwest Area Neighborhood Park Master Plan. And the, the first concept on the left was presented in, in January. And then the current one is on the right. And really here it was kind of winding down or taming down the remanders of that tributary that comes down from Lake Harriet into Minneot Creek. What happens here is the tributary that comes down from Lake Harriet and it comes under 50th and then well, Minneot Creek. Currently this um, tributary stops right about here, goes into a pipe and then up falls into Minneot Creek. Um, and isn't isn't daylighted. So what the park board has done is they're trying to frame this um, master plan for this park as its own unique um, opportunity. I think they I can't remember if they called it a nature ecological you know, focused recreation center. So trying to provide a, a niche within the neighborhood parks themselves um, with this and really proposing a, a complete overhaul of the park proposing to move the, the park building itself to the north and all of the facilities up there. And then south of 50th would be um, more of this kind of nature play area along this tributary and then um, adjacent to the creek. The tree fort. Yeah, the tree fort. And um, under the, the main big um, park space, um, to the on the north side there under that field there is they're still proposing to do the underground storage for the city of minneapolis's southwest harriet flood study so that's always been part of um, this neighborhood park and i know at the last i think it was the last ppc meeting um some of the board members have discussed you know whether this be a priority or not um in trying to refine the concept for this we had a meeting with the park board in the city and we had conveyed was, you know, obviously this is beneficial, but it's really solving a local flooding issue with underground storage and solving a local flooding issue with that tributary backing up. So kind of looking bigger picture with the other concepts and other opportunities along the creek, we thought there's, you know, there's bigger bang for your buck than what would possibly happen at, at this space, which seems to be more of a, a city or park board focus. So newing down, now we're just west of 35W, the Nicolet focus area. Here, um, we really pushed hard to have this, this footprint of the CMP to be enlarged, because that was a really big drainage area that we want to try to capture um, as much as we could there. So if you go, if you look at the, the January concepts to today's, um, that's probably the most noticeable with some additional remandering um, along the, the south there. Mm -hmm. And then segment three, this is um, Portland Avenue cut down the middle there. This was the hottest um, public area of concern again because of what they're proposing to do west of Portland. This area got a lot of attention. Um, not no no concerns generally overall around stormwater remandering. It was mainly about uh, roadway. So here, what's happening is um, because the creek's been ditched, so the, the darker is the current creek alignment. Yeah. Light blue is remanders. You have the creek coming in really really straight here. It's hitting up here, and you also have this huge drainage area coming in this big pipe. And it's all converging right here. And if the board recalls on the, the tour, you saw that big erosion. And it's just swirling right here. So we're trying to do here is 
do a little bit of re-entering, some braiding, slow that water down, do some energy dissipation at that outfall, and then also re-meander just a, a tidge in that area too because what's happening is the, there's not a lot of room for the creek there, and the north bank is... Is it? Is it just a retaining wall? So it's just a, kind of creating a flume through there. So I'm trying to just do more there to slow and stabilize. That's a quick question. Uh, Chris, if we um, have a big pipe and a straight shot coming into the creek, it, it's got some natural ability to you know, scour. Have we ever had any kind of a, uh, an elbow at the bottom, big as it might be, where the water comes in and just goes up? And then, that, no. <laughs> where it, all it's doing is hitting itself as it comes out of the top. Hmm. Um, no, we have not. They, <clears throat> they've used them in smaller situations where mm -hmm. you see a culvert will come to an end, and then there'll be like a wall, a wall, you yes. know, spray there. Um, but typically, they become <laughs> maintenance headaches because okay. they break off. So we haven't done that. We usually try to either direct the flow, slow it down, or provide essentially a catcher's net. Thanks. All right, and then the last well, sec. So, oh. so to build on that too, I mean, what's been fascinating is since say, the district has started this project, um, there's a walking path on the south side of the creek here. And every check-in meeting we have mm -hmm. with staff members, the path slowly disappears oh, over oh. the past years. <laughs> Just to give you a sense of how fast that, that energy is working and how it is kind of critical to so if you're out there, go look. Yeah. You'll see probably 20, 30 feet of that <clears throat> gone. Huh. And that's just in the past year and a half or so. Yeah, and to that point, actually I drove by there last week and they fenced it off now because it's it dangerous. And why we didn't address that with the FEMA repairs was the park where because of all of the roads, um, proposals in here, and just a big traffic headache. They thought there would be some pretty big opportunities, so they didn't want us to come in and repair that. You know, certainly the community's kind of spoken against some of the road stuff, so regardless, um, there'll be a priority towards it, but that's why we pressed pause and did not pursue that um, as part of our FEMA repairs. Is it getting close to the road? It's still, no. I mean, it's probably 30 feet or so. Okay. <laughs> um, so the, the last <laughs> the last segment um, because it's a shorter segment they've just included the whole um, segment as a concept plan the big thing that um, changed from here so I'll go up it's a little bit more zoomed in but um, a lot more remanders proposed in this one and that's because it just, there's just some space to do it. And we heard some feedback. Um, this area of the creek is is pretty valued by the community there, and there's their, they're kind of their niche birding spots or habitat spots. So um, just listening to the community feedback, and it was interesting. There was like an eight- and nine-year-old girl that came to the last meeting and spoke out about certain. They're like, I we've lived here our whole lives. and. <laughs> But um, everything they said, they'd already taken into consideration, so they were very Back pleased. Back when she was young. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is that Sledding Hill dump out onto the creek, actually? I don't think so. You stop before you hit the Yeah. Okay, thanks. That's where that wall comes in. For <laughs> <laughs> the catcher's The catcher's <laughs> So I'm just going to end with next steps. So they're kind of been um, working fast and furious the last month and propose to do the same over the next month if needed um, with some CAC meetings. So as I mentioned, there's the next one is this Thursday, um, and they're going to try to hear recommendations from that Lyndhurst um, area. There was a specific subcommittee um, which took CAC members from the Vineyard Creek Master Plan and from that Neighborhood Master Plan to converge on trying to agree on what should happen in that space. So we'll hear from that group and then just look at broader interpretation and cultural resources aspects for the Creek Corridor. And if there's not consensus out of that, then they'll hold an eighth and ninth meeting to start 
um, trying to refine those and really use those meetings more towards determining priorities. How do we implement? How do we phase um, and do that? And then from now and through August, um, the, the planning staff will be actually creating the actual draft master plan document itself. And then we'll work towards this fall as the goal to have all of the associated public um, councils and policymakers review that draft master plan document, which then starts to trigger community engagement phase three, the public comment period, open houses, those sorts of things. And then the ultimate goal is to hopefully have the park board adopt a master plan at the end of, of 2019. Um, a couple questions. Uh, we're participating, but we're not managing any of the process. We're making sure that we're not planning something that isn't that we don't see as feasible. But we're not directing any of the manager Miller. We've certainly it's a park board uh, process. Um, we jointly selected the consultant team that's working on the master plan process. Wank is part of that consultant team. Um, we're certainly there every step of the way as a um, check-in point, making sure that we're we're comfortable with what's being proposed, um, and where we haven't been, they've certainly listened to our opinions. So, although it's not our specific process, I feel that we've been certainly listened to and, and valued um, the opinions and science that we've brought. The second part of the question. Uh, What's, what would probably be the amount of uh, lineal creep that would be really mattered? <clears throat> Manager Miller, that's something we'll have a better feel for probably in the next few weeks. We've hesitated to try to, you know, they've been asking, what are things going to cost? And it's like, well, first things first, we have to know what it, we were agreeing to before we spend time assessing those things. So we'll start to put, um, once we have actual preferred concepts, we can start to put some of those metrics. Here's how much creek footage. Here's how much those things will cost. Start to assemble an actual prioritization um, um, list, cost, those sorts of things as part of the master plan drafting. Well, uh, I, I, I have no idea what it's going to cost, but I, I presume it's going to be more than we can appropriate in an annual uh, and alarm basis. Uh, we should uh, have somebody explore with the city uh, having them issue a debt on our behalf. Uh, if we, if if we're gonna, I would guess the most economic thing would be to do a bunch of it at one at one time, I mean, rather than a, than a whole bunch of little projects. Uh, so we should get that discussion going after they decide what they want to do. Manager Miller, that's a, a great question. And so I, I did have some questions here to pose to the board at the end. One was just the broader, any comments, concerns on the preferred concepts as you've kind of see them um, transform over the past iterations. The second was, I know the question's been asked of staff, but if the board has any recommendations or on how to prioritize project implementation where where does it make sense that we're the catalyst and lead, knowing that we're not the landowner, knowing we're not the infrastructure owner? And then to Manager Miller's point, how do we begin to contemplate a funding strategy and, and what are some things we should start brainstorming um, to actually get some things on the ground once the plan's adopted? Um, Manager Hegemati and I attended the um, presentation the communications group, I'm glitching on the title. But um, we, I was really impressed with how many times the park uh, board representative was saying that they were moving non-creek functions away and water-related or creek-related functions to the creek and just making it match the terrain and the water access so much better. Yeah, I think that, Manager White, that really reflects out of the community input, which, because this is a pretty natural and passive space, people like that. They're saying, you know, you have a, a neighborhood park two blocks away where you can get all of those mm -hmm. recreational amenities, kind of keep the space wild and natural and push it more to do that where it's currently not, if the space allows. 
Andrew Hajmati. Yeah, the question kind of piggybacking off what, what you were saying, Dick. I'm, I'm curious, help me out, I'm new here. How, how, what is the cost split on this? How much are we responsible for? How much the city, how much the park board, how does that work? Well, uh, the, the park board's got an agreement uh, uh, former Council President Johnson uh, worked it out with the city that uh, they get like, I think it's $400 million over the next uh, 20 years for park improvements. And, uh, uh, but, you know, that's citywide. They got a, an enormous planning process mm -hmm. going. I, I've never seen anything so big and so well done. And, and got everybody engaged in it, uh, that I would think that the only part of the, of the Minneapolis Creek improvements that we would be responsible for is the actual remainder. I, I don't see us, you know, doing any of the recreational stuff uh, in, you know, the, the park-related things. But, but I think it's a big bite just to Remandering and restoring the creek. I mean, that's, that's a lot of many of feet that was shown there. Yep. So I think that's what we should take that position out uh, because, you know, they could spend the money in a lot of other places, the riverfront. I mean, that's going to take tens of millions of dollars. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're not uh, taking a bigger burden than we need to. That's what I was wondering about. Yeah. That, that was really my question. Yeah. Um, because we don't have deep pockets like they do, you know. Well, it's the same thing, yeah. And, and we're not like the typical watershed district uh, in Minneapolis that just does whatever the city wants uh, because we got a bigger tax base uh, that we're responsible to. So we got to make sure that we're spending the money in the most appropriately yeah so my my personal thoughts are you know we'll stick to the remandering the creek and you know the rest of it would be parks responsibility would be, uh, would yeah. be the rest. okay right. no and i'll just add that we've been you know the, the master plan aside trying to have start conversations with particularly the city of minneapolis about trying to align CIPs and what does that look like and out of this process create just a long-term CIP to implement these sorts of things and that will really start to identify who's doing what when who's most you know best suited to, to pay for um, the remanders or you know the, I think the one pl case where the lines get a little bit blurry are out falls and stormwater BMPs you know do we have an interest in helping participate in that those costs even though it's not our to remove those infrastructure because of the water quality and water quantity benefit. But the, the <coughs> thing that we got to, if I can, uh, be aware of is they got separate utilities with mm -hmm. separate sources of funds for stormwater and sanitary sewers and all that other kind of stuff. I mean, it's on your bill every month. It's not general property taxes. It's it's uh, service charges on uh, for those utilities, and the stormwater utility is huge. So they can all these improvements, uh, you know, they they can afford, they can they got resources to deal with. Any other comments? Thanks very much. That yeah. was really thorough. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that was an excellent. I'm impressed. Yeah, yeah. and what I'll, I'll plan to do is, yeah, I just want to make sense once we kind of have things more solidified, um, you know. Where, it's, where it makes sense, the next kind of milestone to check in. But if things aren't drastically changing um, from the preferred concepts that were before you tonight, it'll be more probably just process and um, kind of where we where, where we see going the next two to six months with the, the overall plan. Thank you. Administrator's report. President White, managers, I do have a few items of, of note to tick through. I know the hour is late, so I'll try and be brief. Um, first up is the board's directed staff to continue monitoring the evolving statewide governance framework around aquatic invasive <laughs> species. 
We've been having some conversations about that recently. Um, as part of that, on June 17th, uh, myself and the Research and Monitoring Program Manager, Brian Beck, attended an AIS roundtable with Representative Dean Phillips. And the roundtable consisted of Representative Phillips, Three Rivers Park District Board Chair John Gunyu, the owner of Tonka Bay Marina, Gabe Jabor, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife staff, there are a couple there, but Garrett Peterson's the gentleman I remember, the director of the Minnesota AIS Research Center, Nick Phelps, the executive director of LMCD, Vicki Schlenning, um, president of the Minnesota Coalition of Lake Associations, Joe Schneider, uh, president of Lotus Lake HOA, Lori Susla, and the DNR uh, AIS program manager, supervisor, Heidi Wolf. Um, in the audience are representatives from Lake Minnetonka Association, Freshwater Society, the Watershed District, and then um, various media outlets. And it was a pretty wide-ranging discussion um, with not clear consensus on how to manage AIS, um, which you know is kind of part of the thing that we've been tracking and, and not a surprise. The discussion um, covered the value, varying perspectives on the perspectives of the value of prevention and inspections. Um, why they're effective, why they're not effective. Um, there's discussion around boat design and the work that Mr. Gilbert's <coughs> done with uh, the boat manufacturing industry. Bulk of the discussion really focused on governance um, and the need for a clear statewide framework that was focused. Um, and, and then the last part of that was the funding, always the funding. And so Representative Phillips, um, and I'll send out one of the articles that was, that was written about this with some of his quotes, but generally um, what I heard and, and what he's been quoted as saying is there needs to be state level consensus, consensus on the issue and leadership around um, how inspections are managed, the education and licensing required around boat use and then tying that to stronger penalties because th there's generally a consensus that the penalties are very weak. Um, in response to the request for more money and federal funding and advocacy at that federal level, his response was really, you need a, straight, a state structure to put the money into, and it doesn't seem clear that what that framework is right now, and so he'd asked that group to keep convening and see if um, they can build a coalition that, that makes sense. I think some of the other things that we heard him say is that he's realizing this isn't a local or regional issue, but a state and potentially um, national issue, and that his perspective was that it wasn't a centralized effort in the state to really tackle it. So some feedback for you there. I'm not sure if you have questions on that, but we'll keep tracking it. Good. So the other thing, this might be a little bit longer, but timely, I think, with the strategic communications um, discussions that were kicking off. The boards also asked us to just keep tabs on what's happening with the land use planning community. And we're tracking um, a number of conversations that are happening at the state level in regards to housing policy and uh, concerns over regulation. And that's of interest to us, given our governance model of integrating the built and, and natural environments. So during this last legislative session, we talked about um, the push by the Minnesota Association of Watershed Responsibility. Um, that's an association formed by a developer by the name of uh, Mark Lambert, who'd had some issue in uh, an adjacent watershed. And there's been a push in legislation introduced to reduce regulatory authority of, of watersheds. And he's been, him and his association have been quite critical of the, the watershed lobby um, that's present down at the Capitol and that the, the developers and builders need an equal presence and voice. So I talked to the board about that back in, in March. Um, um, there's a front page article in, in the housing industry news that's produced by Housing First and, and advocacy for builders and developers that provides knowledge and a voice um, for that group. And they'd highlighted the rising costs of homes and affordability in Minnesota. And then Nick Erickson, who's their regulatory affairs manager, um, had referred in that article to the conclusions by former Governor Dayton's task force on housing and housing affordability issues in the state that there needed to be a focused review of the impacts of local regulation on cost and affordability. 
And that article also referenced a report that I can send out to the board. It's pretty interesting called Priced Out. It's all about the true cost um, of Minnesota's broken housing market. And this was produced by the Housing Affordability Institute, which is a impact consultancy looking, specializing in affordable housing policy. And that report's got a number of conclusions that I think start to um, provide more context for this, the legislation that's being introduced and that also relates to the watershed districts interest in integrating with land use and what we're doing with our permitting department. In the executive summary here, they talk about that there's a multitude of rules and regulations developers need to follow, including city ordinances, zoning rules, developer agreements, whatever, and um, that those costs are often hidden and um, that even when costs are transparent, legislators or the regulators have convinced themselves that they're nominal, but with the layer cake of of regulation that's been put in place over time that this particular study um, disproves those beliefs and exposes those costs so there's some there's some findings in here that they're putting out that's now starting to drive the state level conversation that um, they said by nearly every measure new homes in Minnesota cost more than comparable homes in all other Midwest market that a third of new home prices in the Twin Cities come from regulation um, that were about 47,000 homes in Wisconsin cost about $47,000 less to build um, than our side of the river. But then interestingly in the middle here there's a call out about regional government and local and regional water management contributing to costs. So um, that's something that we're <coughs> tracking and then there was a, this, this latest issue of housing industry news um, also talks about Metropolitan Council, the array of watershed districts that maintain oversight, permitting, and fee authority over um, development. So, you know, that's just a report on the, the pulse, I think, at the state level and conversations that Builders Association of Twin City, National Association of Home Builders, and these trade groups around um, housing, what they're talking about. And right on the heels of this, it sounds like Governor Waltz is. Um, called into action a legislative commission um, to dig into this in a little bit more detail. And from here they talk about the key objectives being um, exploring the issues related to affor affordability and then introducing policy or legislative recommendations. So if you kind of piece this together with the legislation that's being pushed on watershed regulation, um, this article calling out local regulation, land use regulation, watershed regulation is driving costs, and then this legislative commission, that's something that we're going to want to be keeping an eye on and, and tracking. I think it dovetails with um, our interest down at the Capitol, but also what we're doing to bridge and, and create partnerships with the land use community and our interest in streamlining and making more efficient um, our permitting program. So a little bit longer of an update than maybe you wanted, but I thought it was good timely information and I'll send that out so you can take a look at it. Don't know if there's questions on that. Good. I thought it was all the costs were fire codes. You know, fireproof buildings and stuff. Mm -hmm. But here we're, we're creating. Well, it's it's not all lumped on us. I mean, they, they do a good job of breaking it out and I'll send it out. There's a lot of information in here. They talk about um, everything from park dedication to improve fire code and safety for structure, but then also just the the coordination costs associated with poorly coordinated regulatory jurisdictions between city, met council requirements, watersheds. So they, they talk about how it's relatively fragmented too and that creates cost, soft costs for developers that are then passed on to the consumer. Um, Quick staff update, aside from Becky's new staff update, or um, pleased to announce that our process to replace the aquatic ecologist position has concluded. Um, as you know, Eric Field Seth left um, us recently. We had a really robust and competitive pool of applicants, and a gentleman by the name of Tom Langer has accepted the position. He's got a really strong background in ecology and aquatic ecology with an emphasis on understanding system stressors and then how that impacts ecological communities and developing management plan recommendations. He's currently employed at WENC and he'll be joining the district team on July 10th. So wanted to say thank you to Chris. <laughs> for 
trading another one. Right. Takes a microphone and <laughs> Right. Arden Park, uh, things are moving along there. A quick note, um, this Friday there will be two bridges craned in and <coughs> dropped in onto the footings that are in place over the creek. So from 10 to noon around Minnehaha Creek, um, the creek will actually be closed down around Arden Park. So that's something Tiffany, Laura, the city of Edina have been working on and, and communicating out to the public. Um, so those bridges should be in. Um, you can go out and check that out. I, I wasn't aware of how big the local treatment facilities are at uh, Arden Park. I mean, that's a big project. How many acres are they treating? Uh, on the east side, I believe it's over 80 acres. Wow. So if you think about an area that goes all the way up to 50th in France, and then south to 54 towards um, to get out to France. So you think about that area, it kind of comes down to a main Wow. <coughs> Impressive. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I think President White covered this, but just wanted to thank the board for an engaging retreat last week. It was really enjoyable to be able to take a few minutes and a step back and get the board's pulse on where we've been, where we are, um, what you're concerned about moving forward and what you're optimistic about and, and just kind of sync up. And I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Mr. Smith too for playing the role of facilitator and teasing out those concerns and insights. And I spoke with him earlier this week and we'll be working together to pull together a, a synthesis that we'll send out to the board. Wonderful. And Tiffany yeah. has some water level updates. I figured I'd do that instead of Mr. Whisker, who usually covers. But um, I just wanted to give the board um, our regular kind of update on things. As you can see, it's been dry um, since our peak in after the Memorial Day rain, the lake has dropped over six and a half inches. And that's really attributed to a very dry June. We've had less than an inch and a half of rain. So we've gone from the 11th wettest May to the 11th driest June. It's just a, how it goes sometimes. So there's been, that's a five inch difference just between May and June on, on precip. Um, and we're hopeful that pending maybe a little bit of rain on Thursday that we might be able to actually reach the elevation of 929.6 which allows us then to ratchet down what we're discharging under the creek to 150 cubic feet per second. Um, the other good news is the dry weather has allowed Lake Nokomis to see significant release. It's dropped over 14 and a half inches in the last month. Um, the weir was opened again today and um, I had to anticipate that um, that lake will probably reach close to its OHW um, in the next week or so. So all things considered, watershed wide, that's really good. Um, Mooney Lake is still pumping. They're kind of struggling just to keep up being a landlocked basin, but are slowly making headway. So I anticipate those pumps will probably just be on. Can I ask a question on, on no. Mooney Lake? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I was on the board when we approved that that, that pump. And um, I, I didn't think I didn't think it was as complicated as it is. Uh, is there any way that we could get the contributing uh, sub watershed to store some of that water before it hits the uh, Mooney Lake? And one side of the lake is overdeveloped, or more developed, I guess it would be the appropriate way of saying, than the other side of the lake, and. Uh, Two different cities. Uh, you know, there's so much surface with all the trees and everything. It's really intense development. Uh, is there anything that you know to prevent some of the flowage into the into the Mooney? Because it's contributing to the Lake Minnetonka. Mm, no. Yeah, it is. Eventually. Well, via yeah. yeah. Doesn't it? <laughs> when you pump it out, it does then. It, isn't it true that on the north side where the houses are, that's a series of ponds already? Yeah, so the short answer is not really, unless okay. you want to rain garden your way to mm -hmm. reduced water volumes, which probably isn't going to have a huge impact. Um, the basin was landlocked after the last glaciers went through. And there was a lake shed tributary to the lake. And then as Plymouth grew and developed, there was um, a couple hundred acres of pipe sheds that were added to the lake. It's fully developed 
um, back in the 70s. There's a series of stormwater ponds that are connected that drain into that northeast side of the lake. Um, and the pump outlet that was put in, there really wasn't, from recollection and some familiar knowledge, because my parents live right over there, um, there weren't, wasn't a lot of structural flooding. There were shoreline impacts um, and yard impacts. And on that east side, there were maybe a handful of homes that were concerned about basements. Um, and so number one is it's built out. There aren't a lot of opportunities to hold more water back or infiltrate more water that would have probably a measurable impact. Um, and the impacts are um, relatively nominal in terms of st actual structural impact in that area. Okay. So nobody over there is really suffering from well, structured now. flooding right now. For like the first eight years, the pumps didn't run at all, right? Yeah, there were some issues with the operations <coughs> and communication back and forth between the city, but that's been ironed out. Okay, and there's only two. I looked at Tiffany. <laughs> yeah, there's... It's not a triplex pump control. So no, it's yeah, okay. it's... Okay, how far is the pipe before it gets to... Um... It, it pipes out of the southwest um, corner through... Southeast. Southeast ish um, out to Peony Lane, which is north of County Road 6. It comes um, south of County Road 6 through a series of ponds into Hadley Lake and then out into Minnetonka. Yeah, the, from where it grabs out of the lake to the pump station is, I don't know, like 100 yards or so before it juts down. The last thing I'll just add is the seven day forecast from the Weather Service looks relatively dry they're talking around maybe two tenths of an inch on thursday and be ready for the heat because they're talking 90 to 100 degrees this weekend so oh really yep. <laughs> and you know lovely dew points of 75. So. oh my goodness yep. thank you thank you Thanks. before a journey i wish you happy birthday mr whisker thank you happy birthday, happy birthday. yeah i got a really good gift this year have you hit 30 yet <laughs> well, I, I, the, the last seven months, I thought I was turning 39, and I ran into somebody who reminded me I was turning 38. So that was, that was my gift. <laughs> <laughs> we are adjourned. <laughs>